Welcome, Kendra. Thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited about this. Oh, I am too. Oh my gosh. you! I feel like your book, it was like, here's how to live your life a little bit better than you're doing. Here are all my tips. And I just took all those and I'm like, I'm running with these now. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad. And who knew, who knew that we would also have a pandemic that we would need to sort of manage. So the timing is... Not great, but also really great. So I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Well, I'm, a, I'm sure the timing for you is not great with the launch. But as a reader, the timing is pretty great for the content. <laughs> so, you know, on balance, maybe it works out. <laughs> totally. I'll take that. OK. Um, the Lazy Genius Way, Embrace What Matters, Ditch What Doesn't, and Get Stuff Done. So tell listeners, please, what your book is about and what inspired you to write this book. Well, what inspired me to write the book was hearing myself and a lot of women that I was in life doing life with and writing on the internet for just so tired all the time. Like we're always just so tired. And I was like, well, I mean, we were told to sort of pare back our to-do list and we need to say no more and simplify our lives. And, but I saw a lot of people doing that and they were still really tired and just tried to kind of pay attention to what was going on and realize that I think that what we are doing is trying hard at too many things and then often trying hard at the wrong things or things that don't really matter to us. And everybody gets to decide what that is. And so as I started to kind of unpack that idea, I was like, oh my gosh, I think, I think we might have cracked a code here. I think we might have found something really great. And so uh, the book, The Lazy Genius Way, is it's not about doing more or less. It's about what doing matters, doing what matters to you. And if you actually spend your energy on what matters and sort of let go of the things that don't, um, and then also begin to accept and engage with people in your life who prioritize different things than you, you know, we, we, that we have permission to care and to care about different things. Like what a world, man. So, uh, it's the lazy genius way is basically like a kind of a self-help personal growth book for people who are just really tired of reading them and like highlighting a few things and cobbling together, like a way to live a meaningful life. It's a, it's a guide, it's a guidebook of principles to kind of help you live a, a meaningful life by your own definition. I love it. So how did you, let's like backtrack. How did you become the lazy genius? Like why you, how did you fall into this? How did you come up with this? When did the whole thing start? Did it start with the blog or the pot? Like, tell me the order of everything. Yeah. So I have been, I've been writing on the internet for 10 years, over 10 years and it's been very, very different stuff. Like I wrote about food. I was like a cooking instructor for a while. And then I had a, like a blog sort of that was celebrities and desserts like paired together. <laughs> Cause those are two <laughs> things that I really love. So like I made, I made things like Cumber cookies, which were like cookies inspired by Benedict Cumberbatch. Like it was a very niche, like it was a very specific thing. <laughs> But it was so much fun. Uh, but I've been sort of, I've been writing on the internet for, yeah, for a long time. But I think I've been uh, sort of the through line of my life is is perfectionism. And sort of like, I've always had the genius part down. And I don't mean that in a, like a back patty, like I'm so good at things. Like, I just mean like really, really focusing on trying so hard at being good or the best at everything. And, um, and then just kind of being worn down. So like as, that was sort of my own personal journey. And I had kids and, you know, you learn a lot about yourself when you have kids. And by the time the third kid rolled around, I was like, okay, wait a minute. I do not have energy for the things that I used to think I did. How do we do this? And so it was like living my own life. I sort of have a systems brain and, and then I'm a writer. And so it's just sort of like all of these things kind of came together into this conflation of the lazy genius and then my my best friend who's a writer uh emily p freeman she wrote a book called the next right thing and she's like really really good at giving names to things it's like a superpower of hers it's really weird and she was like you're kind of like a lazy genius and i went oh and then it just the floor opened up and it was it was beautiful her forward was so nice by the way was. i was like was if lovely. i ever write a book i need to like grab my best friend to write my forward as well because she was just so nice about you coming to her aid and packing up her house and just jumping in and doing what needed to be done and it says a lot sometimes you can tell more from what a friend says about you than what you could possibly say in your own introduction so i thought that yeah. was pretty genius um yeah and i was like i, I cried wonder. i cried a lot when i read it for sure oh <laughs> nice thing ever it was really sweet and it's a pretty special thing like you said like what a special thing that my my best friend got to write 
my forward and that she's a writer. And so that got to be a thing. Like it was really, it was really special for sure. That's so nice. And then when did you start your podcast? My podcast started in, um, well, I started the blog in August of 2015 because my daughter was born in April of 2016 because I always start a business when I have a kid. (laughs) Like every blog is like matched to one of my kids being born kind of weird. Um, and then the podcast was like June or July, uh, after that. So it's been, what is that? What's math? Four years, I guess the podcast has been, but at first it was just me. It was, it was not just me. It was me interviewing people. And I think I realized that I was doing that. Uh, and this is not true of everyone, but I was doing that because I was afraid of being the only one that no one would listen to me because like, who am I to have something to say? And so it was an interesting transition because I did 10 episodes of interviews and then I took a break and kind of reevaluated. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to do this by myself because this matters. And I feel like these are important things to talk about. And yeah, so that was, that was about four years ago and it's been, yeah, we're on 170 something episodes and it's great. It's a lot of fun. I love the show. Wow. And I learned from your show some things about you that you shared in your latest episode about how you had never had a devil stuff Oreo. How is this possible? Where did you grow up? Like in America? (laughs) Like anybody growing up in America has must have, I mean, not to shame people who haven't had it and, you know, good for them for not succumbing to the devil stuff. But I don't know. I was surprised. It was surprising to me too. I think that like, so we, so I grew up, this is kind of, I grew up really poor. And, um, and so whenever we did get like real name brand treats, you, it wasn't very often. And you don't splurge for like the extras. I don't even think there were double stuff when I was growing up. I was just like, you just get Oreos. And I'm such a, um, I'm kind of a like, like a brand traditionalist. Like I don't really veer off like extra toasty Cheez-Its. And, you know, I'm just like original. Like if the box says original, I'll go for that. And, um, and then I had, yeah, I had this like friend of mine who brought me a pack of double stuff, like literally like within the last month. And I was like, I've never had this. Particular, I guess it'll be fine. And it was like, where have I been? Like, I was so upset at all the people in my life who would let me live this long without eating double stuff. I just don't. And now we're a double stuff family exclusively. <laughs> I will never buy original Oreos again. Like ever. I don't. I'm so sad. I'm 38 and I've gone this long without having them. Yeah, it's a problem. It's a problem. <laughs> oh my gosh. You're so funny. Um, so some let's talk about some of the advice in your book because you give such great advice. And one of the themes that you come back to over and over again is starting small <laughs> and how sometimes you just try to do one downward dog a day and like, that's okay. And like, I feel like in every chapter, whatever it was related to, again, it was start start small. Start small yeah. with the laundry. Start small with everything, every project, every everything. So tell me about that sort of overarching principle. Yeah, we start so big all the time, like just the longest lists, so many checklists, tracking every single thing. And, and I think there's something maybe for a lot of us, is it about control? Maybe, you know, that if if things feel out of control that we have to like cloak the entire situation in some grand scheme to make us feel okay. Starting small just doesn't feel like it does anything that we don't, we're not moving, that there's not momentum, that it's not making a difference. Um, like if I, yeah, if I do one down dog a day, like, does that even count? <laughs> it's just like you say it all out. It seems so stupid. But guess what? I have been doing at least one down dog a day. It's going on four years now, I think. And that's like a practice. Now, some days it still is that. And some days it's 10 minutes. Some days it's 30. It's usually closer to 10. 30 is very rare. But I'm doing it. And it's part of my day and part of my rhythm. And if I had not started small, that like embarrassingly small um, choice, I would still be like whining to myself and shaming myself for not being good at yoga or whatever it is, whatever the thing, like fill in the blank of whatever yoga is. So I think that small choices, as long as they're small enough that you're like, oh no, I can, I can do that. Like I can do whatever it is. I can put my shoes by the door. I can, um, I could cook one meal at home a week instead of seven. Like if you're like, I'm going to become, I'm going to become a cook and I'm going to cook for my family, but you don't cook. If you're like always doing takeout and you try seven days, are you kidding me? You will not make it a week. So like start with one breakfast, like just start small because small choices, it's easier to keep making them 
and then you keep making them and then you have that momentum and then you don't stop and then they become habits and it's just, it's way to, um, the, the seduction of like the big machine will get us every time. I mean, it just gets us every time. And that's why we're all so tired because we're trying to maintain all these stupid big machines that we built rather than like just doing one tiny thing, just do the one tiny thing, do one small, one small step and see what happens. Cause what, what is the worst that can happen? You won't move. Well, you're not moving now anyway, and you're just feeling bad about it. So why not not feel bad about it and see if you actually want to move in that direction in the first place. So I just think starting small does, it gets such a bad rap because again, it's not very grand. It's not very sexy, but it really works. So true. I feel like what you said at the beginning too about whether or not it counts, because I'm always thinking about that too. Like, does it even count that I'm taking a walk for like 10 minutes? And then right. I have to stop and be like, well, who is the one counting if not m- me and right. my, my right. own body? And like, isn't it better to walk 10 minutes than what I would be doing, which is sitting at my desk for 10 minutes? So like, sure. why why talk myself out of it? It's At least it's something. So I feel yeah. like that's like my down dog, although I have no habit of it. So you're one step ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's also like thinking about the walk, like there's something really important about naming what matters about even that small choice. And so if you're thinking about, you know, I'm going to walk around the block because that's not a minute thing. Like if you live in a place where there's blocks, <laughs> not everybody does, <laughs> but like if you're going to walk around the block and to ask yourself, why am I wanting to do this? And I think sometimes if we are truly honest with ourselves, it comes down to something that doesn't actually matter. So, um, I know for me for the longest time, this is not true of everyone, nothing is true of everyone. Um, but for the longest time, my, um, like pushing myself to exercise was to make my body smaller. And now I'm like, I don't care. Like, I'm actually like, I'm, I feel good. I feel good in my skin. I have like the energy that it's fine. Like I'm, I, I'm actually doing myself more of a disservice by beating myself up for not being thinner than I am for being in a bigger body and being comfortable in it. And then I just walk or run or do the, my daily down dog or whatever it is when my body goes, Hey, can we move? I would really like to move right now. Like just paying attention. Um, and so naming that naming what actually matters about the, the walk or the run or the whatever and exercise is just one example. When we really name what matters about it, then we're able to actually have like a deeper motivation to do it or, a greater conviction to let it go. Love it. All right. I'm going to try to distill the essence of my walk whenever <laughs> I get a chance. You can do it on a walk. You're like, I'm yeah, going to go I'll on do it on a walk. Figure that, out why I'm here. <laughs> yes. I go on walks to debate why I go on them. And that's, right. that's, that's just enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you also, in your book, talk a lot about your house rules which I thought were so genius and I should really institute more than I have right now. Um, And one of the ones I found most interesting was that you vowed to start a new book within 24 hours of finishing an old one. Otherwise you lose momentum and don't start books. So let's talk about that. Oh man. Okay. So I always get this confused. Have you heard the whole supply and demand reader thing? Like some people are supply side readers and some people are demand side readers. I haven't heard this. No, tell me. I wish I knew who came up with this. It's such a bummer. Um, But it's basically like, and I get it mixed up, but one kind of reader will read anything that's in front of them. Cereal box, magazine, it doesn't matter. So it's good to like put good things in front of them to read because they're going to read anyway. And then there's another kind of reader that will easily choose other things if there is not something good to read. So like you lose momentum a lot easier. And I am that kind of reader. Like I love to read But I also love to watch TV and I also love to like, you know, play cards with my husband or, you know, like there are different things that I can do in those pockets of time that they're not reading. And so I have just found if I lose that momentum, it's like really hard to get it back. And I genuinely love reading. So that house rule has been something that's been really helpful for me is when I finish a book, I need to start another one within 24 hours or I probably won't really start. And and then it's, it's harder to get kind of back on the horse. So it's like a, it's a really, really small thing. And that's what I love about the principle of house rules is it's just one small thing that sort of keeps like, like when you line up a bunch of dominoes and one tips over the rest, you're just basically like if the rest are sort of negative things, like, oh no, everything's burning. <laughs> like everything's falling apart. Um, even in something like your reading life, it's sort of a house rule kind of keeps that first domino from falling. And that is it for me. It's like, well, just read something within a day of finishing the last book. And 
And that means like, if I know that I'm coming to the end of a book now, I, at this point I have like a ridiculous in my house library, um, where I could always reach for something because I've been building up and listening to like paying attention to what kind of books I like and trying to buy those at book sales and all that. But now like before, when I would get to the end of a book, I'm like, Oh, I'm almost to the end of this. I don't, I want to still enjoy the end, but I also want to think ahead. Like, what am I going to read next so that I don't lose that momentum? So it's very, very small. Again, it's a very small thing, but, um, doggone it. If I, if it really helps me keep going. I'm not sure anyone's ever said doggone it on my podcast before. I, as it came out of my mouth, I was like, nope. I love I that. I feel like this is a unique situation. No, nope, I, it called, it called for a doggone it and you gave it the doggone it. And I love it. It's amazing. Thank you for that. <laughs> so what, what type of books do you like to read? Oh, okay. So I, huh, I, I'm trying to, I'm still in a place where I don't want to feel sort of like guilty for saying, for answering that question in the way that I'm going to answer it because no guilt. No guilt. I don't, I don't love to, my default uh, desire to read is not to learn something. Um, now I do read to learn things and I balance it out, but like, seriously, my sweet spot is like space, magic, circuses, um, like a, like a teenage like a poor teenage girl sticking it to the man and she hates the patriarchy, but she falls in love with somebody who's like part of the patriarchy. Like I am such a sucker for that stuff. It just ropes me in. Um, even if the writing's not great, like I will, I will see like a good, interesting story that's world buildy. I will see it through even if the characters are like fine or the writing's like, okay, I just, I can't, I seriously, if there's a circus, I'm done. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> Wow. Or like creeped out fairy tales, like sort of, um, yeah, like, like reinterpreted sort of dark fairy tales. Um, yeah. Anything that's sort of like fantasy and like science fiction, but again, the patriarchy part is always fun as well. So wow, that's very, yeah. uh, you've got a real niche there. Um, <laughs> circus, circus plus I'll be on the lookout for you. I will. And with any book pitch that comes in from now on, I am thinking, would Kinder like, does this have the circus patriarchy elements? And uh, I will take it. So watch out. Yeah. Steady stream. I actually, I've said, I have mentioned it before because I do, I have a few episodes about reading and I talk about all my blogs sometimes. And, um, and so I'll, like the people who have been following me for a while, they sort of know, like, this is the kind of stuff Kendra likes. And it is really fun when I have like DMs and they're like, Hey, I just read this book. And I see the word circus. Like <laughs> everybody's looking for circuses, sending me all, send me all the circus books. I will take every single one. Ironically, terrified of actually going to a circus. So I don't know what that says, but here we are. Here we are. Um, well, sorry. I wish I had been following you before. I didn't, I hadn't heard of you before. And now I'm like, I'm one of the people in the world who somehow has had not. So I'm so glad I did now. And oh. that the people who I know now are going to know about you and, um, you know, um, and all of that. Well, tell me a little more. And this is kind of like a big pivot, but um, I, in fourth grade, your parents got divorced and you yeah. went through like this tough time in your life and you referenced your childhood a little bit. Just tell me a little more about what it was like for you growing up and then what about it do you think sort of made you find your way in the world and had it be similar to this? Mm. That's a good layered question. Yeah, my so my parents split up when I was um, – they divorced for, sh for real in fourth grade. They had split up a couple times before then. Um, my – my dad had just kind of left, like he just left a couple of times before. And, um, and I have a little sister who is seven years younger than, yes, yeah, seven years younger than I am. And so for a lot of the childhood, I, w I was an only child, you know, for those early years. And, um, and like looking back, you know, when you're a kid, you don't really know what you're looking at. You don't always know what you're experiencing, but you might feel it a little bit, like the way that you sort of process your life. Um, yeah, is more attuned to what's really happening. And so looking back, part of me is like, how did I not know that my dad was abusive um, to my mom and to my sister and to me, but all in very different ways. Um, and so, yeah, it was like a really hard, it was a really hard thing. And I mean, obviously that's a stupid thing to say. It was a really hard thing, but it was. Um, and, and I honestly think that one of the things that has been the most galvanizing for me, maybe from that time is, I carried the, this is quite a pivot from the uh, circus conversation, but I sort of carried the weight and responsibility of the abuse that my, the rest of my family, um, was victim to. 
as my responsibility. Like if I had seen it, I could have stopped it. Like it was my fault. And, um, and I really think that that was a huge thing for the first two thirds of my life, really in feeling like I had to be the best that I had to be so dependable that I had to be the greatest friend that anyone would ever want. Like I, it was, I don't know that it was like trying to make up for failing my family. I don't know that I would really put it into those words, but I do think that there's a connection there of like feeling this, there's always been a deep responsibility in me to make sure everything else is going okay at the expense of myself. Um, but not, and, and, and that expense sort of looks like I don't do things unless I can be the best at them. And so it was just a very like thin way to live. You know, it's just a very hollow, like there wasn't a lot of substance to it. I just feel like if any, if anybody blew too hard at me, I would break, you know, like I was working really hard to kind of look put together, um, and feel together, but I was just, a, you know, yeah, anything could have knocked everything off. It's very shaky foundation. And so, um, when I started, you know, therapy is a real big, a real big help and a big advocate of therapy. Um, but when I started going to therapy and I realized that responsibility I was carrying that I think the root of it was my sister and mom, but it also was like, like a tree, just lots of branches and responsibility branches going in lots of different directions. Um, when I realized that it was, it made so much sense about how I sort of look at the world, which is to fix it. It was always like to fix it. I got to make it better. But now that I've kind of removed that negative um, responsibility off the table, that um, poorly rooted responsibility, that's not mine to hold. Now that I've taken that off the table, it's sort of, le it's left the, the essence of my desire to make things better, but for you, not for my own protection, not for my own survival. It's just like, I do have, I, you know, it's feels strange to say, like, I do think I have a gift for helping people see differently to help people see how their lives, their lives by their definition and their standards can be better. Not like copy my life. My life's great. Like that would be dumb. we none of us need to live that way. That's so ridiculous. And so I think that, um, once I sort of worked through that responsibility that I'd carried, yeah, it just left that, that real essence of who I am of like, I really want to like, I really do want to make the world a better place. I kind of joke that I am Pollyanna, but with a clipboard. So I'm like, guys, sunshine, hold hands, let's do this. And then here's a list of how, <laughs> like it's, it's a very specific vibe, but I don't know that I would have ever been able to really access that without having sort of processed where my desire to make things better came from. And that's why, um, I mean, that's why I love therapy, but it's also why I love, um, <laughs> suffering. What a fun thing to say. I love suffering. That's the, the lesson that we can learn from hard, difficult things. There's always, there's a principle in the book called live in your season. And, and it's not that we are supposed to like push through our season and ignore that things are hard. I know that things are really hard for you right now. I've been mm -hmm. watching your Instagram and, um, and I, it's not that we're just like, ignore it. It's hard. Who cares? Power through. That's not helpful for anyone, but also to sit there and just like drown in the emotional weight of everything and not tell yourself the truth or open, have eyes of gratitude sometimes. And I don't mean that in a placating way. Like the trees are beautiful. It's fine. And my mother in law is sick. Like that's not what this is. It's being honest about how you're feeling and also giving yourself permission to feel what you need to feel, but not let it be in charge and to tell yourself the truth. And so all that to say, I think that that is one of the, the gifts of difficult seasons is that they always have something to teach us always, always. And, um, my parents divorce took, yeah, like a solid 20 years to teach me something, uh, that I could put words to, but, um, but it did. And I'm so grateful. Wow. Well, I'm really glad I asked you about that <laughs> <laughs> because now in turn, you've given like me some therapy for the day. So thank you for that. Um, I appreciate it. Wow. I'm going to have to just keep calling you every so often and get my daily <laughs> dose. 
um, like the transitive property from whatever your therapist taught you or something. So uh, oh, thank awesome. you. <laughs> um, so Kendra, you are doing so many things. You're a mom, you're doing your podcast, your blog, this book just came out. Like, I hate to even say there could be more that you could do, but like, what's your big, do you have a big vision of like where you're headed or what you want to accomplish or how you're going to help everybody in the world? Or, tell me. Man. So I hope that this gives some permission to people listening because I did. And I think it's not that anymore. So my dream for the longest time was I wanted to own a bakery. That's really what it was, is I wanted to have a local place. I love feeding people and everybody likes cake. So, you know, um, for the most part and, um, and I make good cake. So I, that was my dream. And I'm not sure if it still is like I I'm in this, like, I'm in this place where I'm in the dreamland, but everything just like went from clear to fuzzy. It's like a reverse Wizard of Oz, you know? It was like, it's so colorful and it was Technicolor. And then I'm back in black and white and I'm like, wait, where are we? I don't know. So, um, you know, I think that that's just the nature of of life. Again, funny sentence to say, but we, we think that something is going to be really valuable and it doesn't necessarily mean that it wasn't when it was but things change and we change. And so, yeah, for a long time, it was to have, have a bakery, but I think now it's just sort of broadened and I don't know how it's really going to manifest. I just want a physical place to gather people. And, and part of me is like, well, (laughs) why would anyone come? Why would I, how can I support my family and my staff by like trying to get people to come and stay at this like property that I have or this building or what do I teach class at? Like, what do I even do? Like it just, it can feel, it does feel overwhelming to think about that sometimes because I don't know what it is. And I don't like when I don't know what something is, which is when I pull out different, um, principles in the book. One that's coming to mind right now about the dream specifically, there's a, uh, principles called go in the right order. And you can go in the right order in cleaning your bathroom. Like you can go in the right order with anything, but really the right order comes down to three steps. The first one is to name what matters. Everything starts with naming what matters. The second thing is to calm the crazy because usually when we're like, what is happening? Like something feels crazy. So we need to calm it down. And then the third thing is to trust yourself with whatever comes next. And I think for this, my order is naming what matters is that I am present in the work that I'm doing now. And also I don't push down the dream so I can be present and sort of let the dream hang out in the room and be like, Hey dream, you're, you're lowercase D right now. I don't know what you look like, but it's cool. Like you can stay. And if you decide to like get brighter or stronger or sharper, and you can tell me something that affects my work right now, that's fantastic. But otherwise I'm just going to let you hang out in the room and it's cool. And then the second step is, so that's what matters. And then the second part of calming the crazy is when I feel the like, I don't have a dream. I don't blah, blah, like starting to spin out, which I do often. The calm, the crazy of that is to usually call someone who knows my heart to call Emily, to call my best friend, to talk to my husband, to call my sister and just be like, Hey, I'm feeling really sad about not having the dream about the bakery. What can you, can you like, tell me some truth? You tell me some good things and that kind of like settles down my brain. And then usually trust the, like the third step, trust yourself with whatever comes next. Usually it's just like to keep going. You know, there's not necessarily a third thing. It's just like, yeah, you can live in this time where you don't know what your five-year plan is, where you don't know what your big dream is. You might not, this might be what it is and that's okay. You know, so it's just sort of being, being okay with being where I am. So that was a roundabout day, a uh, roundabout way to answer. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's next. That's But that's okay. That's it was okay. honestly in my like disheveled set of notes here, calm the crazy was in all caps underlined. <laughs> <laughs> I need to like post it on my computer. Um, do you have any advice for aspiring authors? Oh. Oh man. All right, so there's so much good advice out there. Things like write every day, write even when no one's reading, you know, like all of that. I think that my start small advice, honestly, because a lot of advice feels sort of in the clouds sometimes, or like the everyday part often feels overwhelming. 
And so honestly, my favorite, I would say read a book on writing that you feel excited to read. And my favorite one is um, uh, The Memoir Project by Marion, oh, what's her name? Marion Smith, Marion Roach Smith, Marion Roach Smith. I think that's right. I should look it up. Um, it is like a really beautiful, even if you don't write memoir, there was something to, in reading that book that just made me go like, oh, and to stop doing writing exercises. She was like, no more writing exercises, no more things to sort of just like doggy paddle around the idea. It was sort of the good mentality perspective to get you uh, compelled to write every day, to let other people into your writing, to uh, pitch magazines for, you know, to get your foot in the door and that kind of thing. It was like this really lovely permission giver that book was, even though I'm not a memoir writer. Like she just writes about writing in such a way that was, and it's so skinny. It's this tiny, tiny little book. Like you can finish it in like an hour or two, um, but so rich. So that would be my advice is to read that book. Cause that feels like something people can do rather than like write every day. And I'm like, but what? <laughs> like that's part of the problem. But what do I write? So maybe, maybe <laughs> reading Marion Roach Smith is a good place to start. Starting small. I love it. Yep. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I am so happy that I met you today through Skype and through this podcast and got to Same. be entertained by your personality. And I feel like part of our brains are very similar. And um, hearing you say all that stuff really helped me. So um, thank you. I'm really, really happy we talked. Oh, me too. This has been a delight. Thanks, Zibby. No problem. Thank you. Have a great day. 